Are you an American citizen? If so, do you know that your government has not only been intentionally lying to you, but using propaganda against you in order to get you to believe marijuana is bad? I know, you don't care about the marijuana issue, and that's okay, this isn't about that. The purpose of this presentation is not to argue for the legalization or decriminalization of marijuana. The purpose of this presentation is to prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that your government has been intentionally deceiving and manipulating you, using propaganda, when it comes to marijuana. This is not something that should be taken lightly. If you will just take the time to watch this presentation in its entirety, you will see undeniable proof of how you've been victimized for decades. Please pay close attention. Although people around the world have been smoking marijuana for thousands of years, the custom only reached the United States at the beginning of the 20th century, when it arrived in the Southwest with a wave of Mexicans looking for work. Pipers, please. Next. To these poor laborers, smoking marijuana was a way to relax after a long day of working in the fields. But white Americans along the border didn't much like these foreigners or their strange customs. Marijuana, it was rumored, gave the Mexicans superhuman strength and turned them into bloodthirsty murderers. One evening in El Paso, some white Texans were allegedly attacked by a Mexican that went crazy on the killer weed. Moving swiftly, the El Paso City Council passed a law banning possession of marijuana. Supposedly designed to control marijuana, the law quickly became a way for the city to control Mexicans. Was it all about racism, or was race merely used as a way to get white Americans the majority to fear? Think about this, marijuana hemp had to have been hated at this time due to what it would have done to the production of a certain cash crop called tobacco, farmed since early America alongside cotton. Owned by wealthy, powerful men. North America's tobacco, facing South America's marijuana in a battle of best cash crop, Marijuana hemp would have one hands down, and tobacco would have been practically replaced. Those wealthy, powerful men would have lost a substantial amount of income. Unlike the people of El Paso, most Americans had never even heard of marijuana. They were more concerned about the rising addiction to opium, morphine, cocaine, and heroin, which were all serious public health issues. But instead of treating drug addiction as a public health problem, the federal government put control of these drugs in the hands of the Treasury Department, who created the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Rolling. This is Harry J. Anslinger, Commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Oh, sorry. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against the despicable dope-peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. 
America's first drug czar was Harry J. Anslinger. A law and order evangelist, Anslinger would shape America's attitude toward marijuana for generations to come. Like many Americans, Anslinger was a prohibitionist. These morally correct citizens sincerely felt that progress could only be achieved by controlling the depraved impulses of the masses. Swordfish. He believed that if the laws were tough enough, America could be rid of alcohol. Put enough people in jail, and eventually the public will learn to behave. And he applied this same philosophy to mounting the government's war on drugs. Special Treasury agents are part of a massive force created solely to control the traffic in narcotics. You got any merchandise obtained in Canada or abroad? No. Have you any liquor? No. Get out of the car and let's take a look at it. Come on. Move over, J. Edgar Hoover. Here come the agents of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Like J. Edgar Hoover, Anslinger posed for the cameras, creating the impression he was smashing one major dope ring after another. But he found out pretty quickly that policing 48 states on a depression-strapped budget was impossible. His solution was to try to convince the states to police local drug traffic themselves. Campaigning tirelessly, he lobbied each state to sign a joint agreement to commit state resources to fighting drugs. But only nine states signed on. The other 39 viewed it as federal interference in their affairs. It was a major defeat for the young drug commissioner, but he wasn't the type to give up. Meanwhile, marijuana, carried by West Indian sailors, arrived in port cities like New Orleans. Known as Muggles, Tea, or Reefer, it was popular with the jazz crowd because it made music sound so good. From here, musicians carried it up the Mississippi to urban centers in the north. With marijuana showing up in the big cities, Anslinger realized it might be the answer to his problem. If he could persuade white America that marijuana was a deadly menace, frightened voters might push their state legislators to sign on to his Uniform Narcotics Act. you want. You want to kill me. <laughs> In this case, the state waives trial of the defendant, Ralph Wiley. It is convinced that he is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. It is recommended, Your Honor, that the defendant be placed at an institution for the criminally insane for the rest of his natural life. I see no reason why the request should not be granted. Wrap your child round this stick of cheese. Blow this game and get high with me. Determined to get the act passed, Anslinger unleashed a media campaign to make the public believe that this little-known plant growing at the side of rural roads was the biggest threat America had ever faced. Not long ago the body of a young girl lay crushed on the sidewalk after a plunge from a Chicago apartment window. 
Everyone called it suicide, but actually it was murder. The killer was a narcotic known to America as marijuana and to history as hashish. Used in the form of cigarettes, it is comparatively new to the United States and as dangerous as a coiled rattlesnake. How many murders, suicides, and maniacal deeds it causes each year, especially among the young, can only be conjectured. In numerous communities it thrives almost unmolested, largely because of official ignorance of its effects. Anslinger's campaign was tailor-made for the lurid tabloid press and supported by an army of moralist groups that captured the public's imagination. Movie Tone News, covering the world to bring you the news. He's a man that smokes that job, that job will take you for a job. Once if he's still the last, when you smoke that kidney job. America is threatened by a new drug menace. Street corner vendors whose stock in trade is the deadly local weed marijuana pass it out in cigarette form. From ingeniously concealed containers, the reefers go to the waiting hands of deluded youngsters. Police find a city backyard full of dope. This innocent looking weed is Mexican marijuana, which when smoked produces more nightmares than opium. Captain Mooney of the narcotic squad will tell us something about it. The constant use of these marijuana cigarettes causes temporary insanity. Yes, Let's go, Jack. I'm red hot. state voted for the Uniform Narcotic Act, and so should yours. The propaganda campaign was successful beyond Anslinger's wildest dreams. One by one, state after state signed on. Gentlemen, take your seats. But now, Frightened out of their minds, the American public demanded that the federal government pass new laws to fight marijuana. Terrified voters wanted action, and their government responded. Without any public debate, scientific inquiry, or political objection, the Marijuana Tax Act was signed into law by President Roosevelt. The act prohibited possession of marijuana anywhere in the United States without a special tax stamp from the Treasury Department. And the Treasury Department didn't give out any stamps, effectively making marijuana illegal. Overnight, a new class of criminals was created. To the Treasury agents of the Bureau of Narcotics comes the job of wiping out this traffic. And in 1937, we smashed 10 major narcotic rings. Only the cooperation of an awakened public can make, will make uh, the hell of it.